Cool. Um, thanks, everyone. My name is Tim Galvin. I'm a postdoc at the CSIRO in Perth, Western Australia, and I'll be talking to you today about classifying radio sources. Um, I'm presenting this work with a number of other collaborators, many of whom are here today. And with all that said, the problem that we will have in the next decade or so is in the radio world, we have a wonderful suite of new instruments coming online, and in many respects, these are orders of magnitude better than conventional instruments. And the simple fact is we'll have too much data to really work with. And you really have to question at that point, how do we go about extracting knowledge? How do we go about doing science? Uh, to try to frame that a little bit clearer though, over 40 years of radio astronomy, we've detected about two and a half million objects in the sky at radio wavelengths. In five years time with a single project called EMU, which is one of the key science projects of the ASCAP instrument in Western Australia, we'll have upwards of 70 million. So it's a massive step up in a very short amount of time. So with that said, a specific problem I've been sort of tasked with over the past year is how do we go about cataloging uh, objects? Um, just to give you a few simple use cases, the contours represent radio emission and the color represents infrared. And basically, when we have uh, contours aligning with uh, color, there's enough information there to say that these are unique galaxies that are unrelated to their surroundings. Uh, the second case, same thing, we're starting to see a little bit of uh, structure being resolved in the radio, but that's still sort of easy to deal with because it's all contiguous, it's all connected. The real problems come in sort of images three and four. Um, here, the structure in the radio is being powered by an AGN, or a, it's a supermassive black hole in some host galaxy. And the name of the game here is to recognize, first of all, that these radio components are all related to one another, as well as identifying which is the host object that's producing them. And you need radio and infrared wavelengths or, or multiple wavelengths to really make that dis a distinction. And then you have to ask, how do we present that information in our catalog? How do we go about describing the relationship between these three radio components and the host galaxy in our, in our, in our uh, corresponding catalogs? Um, I mean, a lot of people have done sort of aspects of this problem. If you're familiar with Radio Galaxy Zoo, any hands? I mean, okay, I don't see anything, but you know, I'm blind, so. Um, I mean, the, you, you can crowdsource the problem. Um, you can ask members of the general public to do it. You can get expert astronomers to do it, but you won't have enough people. Um, and even then, there's gonna be some time delay. If you decide to wait a number of years to get statistics, you've waited a number of years. Um, you could obviously, apply machine learning methods, that's why we're all here today, and a lot of people have done that, uh, convolutional neural networks, obviously. Uh, at least a few recent papers about that, but the problem here is labels. I mean, what to do? I, the fact is we are looking at a new volume of the universe with new instruments, often at new sensitivities and often at new frequencies, so current labels, how well do they extrapolate? It's hard to tell. How are you biasing yourself by using labels we've constructed from the local universe? And even if you change something like, uh, the frequency you're looking at with these new instruments, how have you biased yourself there? Because new frequencies or different frequencies often mean different physics. Um, so with all that said, I wanted to approach the problem from a pretty different direction. Um, the starting position we, will guarantee, we, we are guaranteed to be at is we'll have a set of images from these new instruments and a set of source positions which we can get from a source finder, like a GN or Pi BDSF or, or whatnot. Um, and I really wanted to see how far could we go towards answering the problem I've just described with just this starting position. And really the, the answer is all about the tool you choose. Um, if you've been to astroinformatics in the past, you've probably heard of PINK. PINK is a piece of software that implements the self-organizing map, map algorithm with respect to image data. And importantly, it implements rotational invariance in how it goes about doing it. Um, I'm not gonna talk about a lot about how it works, but as an example, here is a SOM trained against 200,000 images of objects selected to be in Radio Galaxy Zoo. These are radio images, um, and you see that there is a very clear change in morphologies across the surface of the SOM. Important to note that basically the idea is if you take any random image from those 200,000 training images, there is a neuron somewhere on this map that represents it. And importantly, these have been learnt in a completely unsupervised way without any prior knowledge about anything within those 200,000 objects. So that's where I sort of started. Um, I took the first radio catalogue. It was a survey conducted with the VLA. 
Um, it described the positions of about 950,000 sources or source components. Basically, there were 950 rows in the catalog. Um, and the name of the game was to, how do we identify the rows in that catalog that are related to one another? And how can we go about identifying the potential host galaxy that produced the radio emission? Um, I downloaded postage stamps uh, from these positions from the first and wise catalog server. That took, you know, Antonio, <laughs> uh, you spoke to me uh, with this. So, um, and with a little bit of pre-processing, I made these image cubes and applied pink to it. And this is one of the largest songs I've, I've trained. Um, this is the radio channel because I made image cubes. Um, there are 40 by 40 neurons here, and I realize it's very hard to see because it's so compressed and the slides are small, but you can make out a change in morphologies. Um, I can talk at length about how I scaled up to this point, but I won't. Um, and this is the infrared channel. And the idea is neurons in the same position on this lattice go hand in hand with one another. Um, to drill down to some examples, just to make it clear to you, um, on the left is the radio channel, on the right is the infrared, and if you were to look at this, you would say this is an AGN. You have two radio lobes, and you've also got the infrared host co-located between them. And importantly, this has been learned completely unsupervised. I did no masking of nearby sources within a field or whatever like that. It was just, here is the data, what can we do? Um, these neurons are on the scale of three and a half arc minutes in either direction. Uh, so you, that will give you a sense of size. Um, here is another pretty cool object uh, that was learnt completely unsupervised. Much the same as before, except now we've isolated you know, the radio core. Um, and that radio core aligns quite nicely with what we've learnt in the infrared. And we've also learnt cases where objects are unrelated to one another. So here we have a point source in the centre. It is uh, present in both radio and infrared. And we've also learned to recognize this thin on the outside. In this case, it's probably an AGN. It's elongated. It's also got its own infrared host. So because they, are, they, they both have their own infrared host, you can probably say that the structures learned by a pink in this particular neuron are unrelated to one another. Um, but what's the whole point of this? Well, first of all, immediately, you have structured your previously unstructured complex image data. And you've done that using an unsupervised manifold. Um, so if you were to go through and look at particular neurons, uh, you could basically look at which sources have best matched with that. And that gives you a really cool, uh, that gives you the really cool opportunity to go hunting for the really unique stuff. So this was a particular neuron that stood out to me because first of all, the radio lobes appear to be quite circular. They're very strong, but the infrared also has this a whole bunch of, bunch of crud all around it. And when you look at the sources that best match this neuron, they are all these wonderful AGNs with super bent tail stuff. And it's just a case that pink kind of threw its hands up and said, well, the lobes are too complex to model individually, so I'm just going to throw these big circles and, and catch it all. And it also probably tells you something about the infrared envir uh, about the, the environment, because the infrared neurons were so sort of uh, weird. Um, it might be telling you that those, those environments are more complex, more dense, or, or whatnot. I mean, but we can go one step further, because um, pink achieves rotational invariance through brute force. Um, it doesn't use some super clever, super sophisticated CNN to learn rotations. It just computes many realizations of your, your image at different rotations and compares those realizations to each neuron. So by mapping an object to the surface of the SOM that Pink has trained, you have come up with an explicit transform function. So if you set aside six hours of your day and you label those 1,600 neurons like I did, um, you can label not only what something is within a neuron, but you can label where it is. And at this point, because you know the sky reference frame for any input image, you know the explicit transform function that Pink has derived, and you know the pixel locations of those features with a new neuron, you can achieve absolute sky positions for those features, which is particularly important for resolved objects like AGN. So on the right here, the top is uh, the radio, the bottom is infrared, and what I've simply done is located the pixel positions. I can't see the green, but... Um, I've simply recorded the pixel positions of those related components, and you can see those as the open face pink boxes. Because I know the sky reference frame of an image, because I selected the source, um, I know where those pink boxes are, and I know, it, I know the explicit transform function to sort of align those features to one another, 
I've achieved uh, absolute sky positions for those features, which immediately gives me an opportunity to go about linking those objects together in catalog space. But we can go better, because essentially the neurons, the way the sum works is through some sort of uh, rotation and stacking and uh, uh, averaging. So the neurons themselves kind of represent a sort of probability density function of, of intensities. So you can take a neuron, you can apply some sort of thresholding, FUD feeling, and, and with a little bit of information from the annotations I provided, um, you can go about creating these really cool masks, uh, binary filters, basically. And what the idea is, is for each source or row in your catalog, you can identify the best matching neuron, you can uh, go grab the corresponding filter, um, and then you can, with the transform function that Pink specifically or explicitly gives you, you can project those filters through catalog space. Um, the one on the right is an example of this. Um, again, the neuron is three and a half arc minutes in either direction. You see the filter. Um, and in this particular case, there were four uh, rows in the first catalog that sort of fitted through that filter. So that gives me information to suggest, because uh, remember, I've got infrared to all these. I'm just not explicitly showing it here. There's enough information for me to link those four objects together in the catalog space. And the analogy is very much like the game you would give a toddler. You know, they have to get the shape and derotate it to slide it through. You know, I'm, it's basically exactly that, except we're learning what the shapes are as we're uh, processing the, the training set. Um, so, I mean, as an example, here is a real uh, bit of sky from first. All the open face circles represent rows in the first catalog. Um, the ones which are in red are ones which we have identified as being related to a single intrinsic process, in this case an AGN. The green uh, marker represents where we predicted the infrared host for this particular object to be. And what's really cool with this example is that although there is this nearby first source, again, I don't see, oh, there, okay, yeah. Um, although, although there's this nearby first source, uh, it wasn't linked to this much larger thing. And when you go looking at this particular example more closely, I would agree with that type of classification. Um, and again, just another cool one, um, another sort of large uh, result, set of resolved radio components. We've been able to uh, recover their intrinsic leak through this sort of masking and, and projection process. And importantly as well, there are uh, slightly more objects nearby, but again, we've sort of managed to segment them out. Um, and we've done this using completely unsupervised methods, no prior knowledge about the training data, um, only the outputs from an unsupervised algorithm. Um, with all that said, thank you very much. Um, some closing thoughts, and I hope I am on time. Yes. Yeah, cool. Thank you.